Hello, good afternoon. I do hope you are hearing me well. Uh, due to unfortunately, we are experimenting, experiencing some issue with uh, with Zoom connection. And uh, welcome to this uh, to this session about privacy, security, and trust for digital living. I'm Robert. This is Roberto Di Bernardo from Engineering Engineering Informatica. I am involved uh, in several initiatives on uh, smart cities in particular within uh, Big Data Valley Association and, and Fireware Foundation. And we are also supporting some uh, meme, OASC memes uh, working group. Uh, so um, I'm glad today to, the, to, to discuss about, to introduce you the, uh, this session. Uh, we, now, nowadays, uh, uh, we know that smart territories, smart cities can collect data with new sources of information. Uh, to to some better support uh, uh, people working and living uh, in, uh, in a specific territory, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, data are essential to is essential to support uh, with the more customized work, uh, services and uh, proactive also proactive services uh, citizen living in a territory. Uh, today we also about uh, proximity economy that means to know better uh, people living in a specific in a specific area uh, they, they, but in any case uh, we are facing on the other on the other side challenging in using in more in reusing data uh, the European Commission uh, is pushing for uh, uh, for supporting Europe in this. So the European data strategy is promoting the reuse of data and we learn about several instruments to support uh, this, uh, in particular uh, the data space. And um, also uh, we also talk about uh, twin, digital twin, in particular in the session yesterday, we heard about uh, local data space, we heard about a local uh, digital twin, but uh, in order to implement uh, actual data space to support this, one concept is uh, at, uh, it's essential, at least the concept of trust. Uh, in order to support trust, several pillars are uh, are required also from some study, some uh, uh, documents even from uh, the digital the big data value association that are uh, data uh, governance people organization and technologies so here uh, again it's important uh, uh, of uh, of putting together people putting together new process for data sharing within uh, uh, each entity involved in the game, it's about technology, it's about upskilling. Uh, I, I would like to, 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 to mention uh, during a, an event last year uh, at the ATOG, the head of unit uh, C3 mentioned me that it's not about talking of uh, uh, data economy, but now we are talking about data society. So again, the importance of people, we need to put uh, at the center people and it's important to how to manage and create trust uh, uh, when we talk about uh, personal data management uh, to, today together with me i'm proud to introduce you uh, relevant speakers uh, we will have some speech from uh, uh, michael merkin from uh, open agile smart cities for those connected just now uh, Michael is a uh, means ambassador uh, at uh, Open Agile Smart Cities. Uh, it uh, deals with several activities uh, concerning uh, uh, standardization and uh, many activities related to how technology can help cities for work better. Uh, then we have uh, Mika Levo from the city of Helsinki, it's uh, information security offer uh, officer sorry uh, good experience on open source uh, uh, software and uh, in managing and building high tech team also with the previous experience uh, in private sector we are also 
it's a pleasure to have with us also Mika uh, Utamaki from uh, Vastu Group, uh, it's a dep deputy managing director there with a lot of experience uh, regarding innovative service development and sustainable data uh, business and also pretty much involved in activity related to my data. But now I uh, stop myself talking and I uh, would give the floor to our first speaker. So uh, please, uh, um, Mikael, uh, the floor is yours. Right, privacy, security and trust for digital living. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, let me just get this out of the way. Um, so. I think what's important to say as we start this, um, we're looking at these three things, privacy, security, and, and trust. And I think it's important to remember that there are two aspects of privacy, both of which are important in digital living. Uh, the first one is the one that we often hear about, um, which is about and, and GDPR and, and, and so on. It's how organizations, whether it's a public or private organization, can manage personal data that it holds in a way that protects individual privacy and is compliant with regulations GDPR. And that's what um, we're looking at in MIM4 is about personal data management, or as we say, it's about how I can manage my own data. It's uh, providing the citizen with control themselves of their data so that they can use and so that they can use their personal data to enable uh, um, themselves to access the services that they need. Um, can you still hear me? Hello. Yes, we we are facing with some uh, some connection fault, but uh, we can uh, still hear you. Thank thank you, everybody. This is um, obviously a big challenge, but um, so if we could think about the subject of today, there are three interlocking issues. Um, there's how organisations can um, manage personal data to ensure privacy is is maintained. There's how the citizen can be in charge of their own data and manage how it's used. And then there's the whole issue of data security, because clearly one of the key issues is, is if, if any data held by myself or by another agency about me is hacked into or anything happens to it because of any, uh, any security issue, then again, um, privacy is not uh, maintained. So um, I just want to go through each of those three points very briefly. Uh, MEM4 is about how I can be given the control over my own data. So in other words, how can, um, how can I have the ability to give permission to who can have access to my data and who can aren't and for what purposes people can use my data or data about me so that I can always remain in control and um, to make sure that any app uh, could, could digitally can have access to the relevant attributes about myself to enable me to see how the amount I should receive because of health conditions without unnecessarily disclosing any personal information about me. So how can I, I make sure that decisions about me are being made not according to detailed personal information about myself, but purely in terms of the steps that are needed to be made. And that's really what MIM4 is all about. Um, now, the challenge about MIM4 and about putting um, the citizen in charge of their own data is that we and we can see that there are many initiatives that are working hard on providing the kind of solutions to make that possible um, and we can see not only is it about initiatives 
scientists that are looking at putting the specifically putting the individual in charge of of their data but also citizen cards that not are, are about not just simply uh certifying that i am who i say i am but actually providing information about uh key attributes about myself card or a, a digital wallet to access services that i'm eligible for so lots of different initiatives um and and that's the problem really that um what we have is the challenge is the business model we know at the moment that our personal data is already owned uh, uh, many large um uh internet we know that many of us aren't happy about that but what's the alternative um it's not something that a small startup can simply do something and challenge google facebook uh, and others um so um uh, 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 and the, of course the problem with many customers using them for many different things it's it's all very much in a startup mode and so um if we want to actually start to give citizens control of their data we need to do this in a step-by-step -step way and locally community managed data ecosystems cities communities that um, look at how they can provide uh a service to the citizen that will allow them to to be able to use the data that the public sector effectively holds about them um to gain real value and benefit they're a very good place to start because within the community within a city uh, there could be a whole range of different services that i could have access to using data about myself that make it worthwhile my joining that ecosystem and and using it effectively so this is a very good place to start um but the other thing that's really important is uh to help to start to align all the many very clever very passionate very competent organizations and people that are working at this so that it's not lots that there can be a, um a, a sense of interoperability between them so that even though there are many people many organizations with solutions that they can be working in a, in a, in a way that that provides them with a scale that gives them much more credibility and that's what we're trying to work on with mim4 and and we'll hear a lot more about that um in in, in a few moments and so that's a really really important uh, thing to challenge and that's why i think mim4 is a very important um uh, aspect for us to be working on but i just want to briefly look at the other two um issues um managing privacy and this is a very important issue for any local data ecosystem it's um the the the, the challenge here is how can data sets that include personal data be anonymized to provide useful information about service effectiveness without enabling an unauthorized person to access personally sensitive information and the particular challenge about that is if you start to link several anonymized data sets where it personal data could be inferred by the way you bring them together um, and this is not an easy issue to solve the problem is that um, when we're looking at local data spaces and data ecosystems, it becomes a very wicked issue, as we've been talking about over the last few days, uh, because it's challenging enough within my own organization to be able to protect uh, personal data um, and, and, and make sure it's it, I'm not um, uh, unintentionally leaking data by or but by bringing together anonymized data sets. But when I think about taking maybe an anonymized data set that I've gathered and putting that into a data space, which other organizations can access, then um, it becomes a, a real worry to me that maybe uh, other organizations might add data to my data set that then makes it uh, make 
people able to understand to, to to find out personal information through it and that I become legally as well as reputationally damaged uh, because of putting my this data into that local data space and, and clearly uh, the important thing here is we need to make sure there's appropriate terms and conditions um, in any local data ecosystem about how data sets can be used to make sure that uh, that we can have the confidence to put personal data into it to make sure that um, that we can cover ourselves legally from any potential damage and, and also reputationally that might come and, and, or, and, and to make sure it's not actually won't come because it can be prevented. And just quickly, um, I've got the privilege of um, being on one of the advisory boards for Open Energy UK, which is really it's that's it's um, working with the regulator, the energy regulator and the UK government to set up what's effectively a local energy data space. Um, to bring together uh, energy about uh, data about energy, all sorts of data about energy from suppliers, uh, the, the, the grid, from and, and all the the ecosystem uh, to help manage that energy system effectively. And they've done a very uh, detailed work of analysing the different sorts of data that there might be. And I'm just putting one of the different kinds of data sets that they've. Um, looking at about potentially having in, in their data space is data sets which include personal data. Um, and that can include even things like smart meter data, because even though smart meter data, uh, you might think, well, that's just about energy use. But of course, if people find out that uh, energy is being used in the home in the daytime, then they know probably somebody at home. And there's all sorts of things that you can infer from it. And so they've decided that Initially, at least, they're just not going to do any of that. They're not going to have any data set in their local data space that has that kind of personal data in, in it. Um, and even though they're working very hard at getting a good set of terms and conditions in place, they've decided to park this for the time. We need to explore so that we can make sure that as we set up data, uh, data spaces um, in Europe and around the world, that we're able to cope with that. Um, and then finally, data security, um, because clearly, again, as we start to share data between agencies and, and put data into common data spaces, um, each, um, each step, each path uh, that we're sending the data on adds another layer of vulnerability in terms of security. And um, it's really important that we manage that effectively to build the trust. So in closing, here are three key issues that need to be tackled. Uh, how a citizen can manage their own data, how an organization who wants to share data in a local data ecosystem or data space can do so in a way that they can have confidence that the privacy will be maintained. And then how to make sure that as we start to share data between agencies, uh, more and more that the security can be kept at a very high level. Uh, the thing about all of these is that they'll all have wider benefits. Um, it, if we look at how we can set up a local data ecosystem to ensure that organizations can have the confidence to put data that has some personal into it, because they can be confident that it can't be misused, that uh, nothing can be inferred from it. If we get the terms and conditions right for that, that will mean that we'll have a very strong and well-managed local data ecosystem. Um, and if we look at how uh, to manage uh, my personal data, it's not only about personal data, but it also provides us with many lessons about managing business sensitive information that comes from the different agencies that are involved. But I think the, the thing that really I'd like to, um, to, to end on is that um, even though all of these three aspects are very important, um, key point about MIM4 is that if a local administration 
can say to the citizen, we, we um, don't feel that our role is to look after your data and make decisions about your data. We want to give you that responsibility and makes it very easy for the citizen to know that they are absolutely in charge of who can see their data, who can use it, and for what purposes they can use it. That is providing the citizen with a real sense of, hey, this, my city, my community, trust me, my city is giving me power. And that is a very important of building that trust that, that the citizen needs to have in their administration to make them more free, more willing to freely uh, share with them that would. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, many thanks for this uh, for this uh, nice nice speech that put uh, together different uh, uh, different angle and, and perspective. Uh, we, we, we 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 learn a lot about uh, managing own data regarding the, the the level of single the single person. Then, of course, the number of challenges are increasing, moving at uh, uh, entity entity level why so looking at it uh, in a wider perspective but even more at ecosystem level where we add the several uh, entity sharing data in a common data spaces it was important that you mentioned uh, uh, one element uh, of um, one aspect to be clearly considered is about uh, business model and then you also put a clear en element where you said that uh, uh, um, one uh, for sure one of one scenario that uh, clearly put together on one side the potentiality of using data and on the other side the, the challenges is the city level. For this, I would uh, pass uh, uh, the floor uh, to the next uh, speaker, uh, Mika Levo, that could give the, us the, the, the perspective of a city. Mika, so uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's see how much uh, stuff this uh, system will <laughs> tolerate, so to say. <laughs> At the moment, we can hear you very well and also see you very well. So yeah, let's, let's, let's uh, try and see what happens if I try to share the one slide I was going to show you. Uh, in Finland, we have this. Uh, saying that uh, the person without slides is somewhat uh, lacking in, in uh, context, but uh, hopefully the uh, amount of slides is not uh, straightly uh, comparable to the uh, value of this speech. Uh, so I'm Mikael Evo, uh, currently working as, as a uh, leading uh, data architect for City of Helsinki. And uh, what I was going to talk to you all about is, is uh, uh, trust and privacy in, in a uh, uh, data-rich environment and, and through the uh, viewpoint of, of a city. And uh, Helsinki is, is a uh, capital city in Finland, and we have a lot of, lot of different uh, services that we offer our our uh, citizens and of course tourists tourists and uh, other other people and uh, to provide these services we often need some data on, on our clients and also we need some uh, some data uh, that we can kind of be certain that it's correct uh, because of, of uh, there are laws and stuff which require us to check if somebody is is uh, is uh, eligible for some service or or some discount in in the fees or or some other stuff, so that we serve our clients equally and uh, by the rules. And uh, I go through a simple use case. Some of you may might have seen this in in some other seminar or or, but uh, I think this kind of like shows showcases how the trust and privacy can can be and, and should be handled in in a complex environment and, and uh, local government environment so we have 
daycare and with some uh, there is, is a discount for, for the daycare fee. Uh, the full fee is something like, uh, well, let's say 400 euros, <clears throat> but then you can get a discount up to, so that it's zero euros if you have some, some uh, low income or, or some other, other social points. And uh, to simplify this for our clients, uh, uh, we somehow must, must be able to, to get their, the data of, of their income. And this data currently is kept up by the tax authority, of course. They know what everybody <laughs> earns and, and so forth. And uh, to simplify the lives of our customers, we have introduced a system where they can give consent that uh, we can check the income from the tax authority. And uh, for this, of course, we need the tax authority to trust that city of Helsinki won't use that data for anything else, and that we actually have the consent. The parents must trust us that we don't use the data for anything else. And uh, we have a valid need for the data. And of course, then in some cases, for example, the parents don't want the other parents to know their income. That's pretty weird, but that kind of things happen. So what we have done is that uh, we have this uh, my data operator model, which means that we have a uh, separate entity that only handles the consent of things. We have an access gateway that only gives the data. It, it, it's actually a uh, so general that it can be put in front of almost any API. And it only gives the data in that API when there is a valid consent that is currently, currently in, in force. And it also records when and, and for what the data was, was uh, given. So we have a kind of like separate log keeper for this, that data. <clears throat> and of course, we can then prove both to the citizen and to the uh, authority that, okay, we do this exactly by these rules. And uh, by this, this uh, exchange so that uh, the code is actually open sourced and, and verifiable. And of course, to maintain the trust, we must also be able to show the actual persons using the data, the par parents that uh, we only use it. We, we are legally bound to only use it for what we state we are using it. And now one thing in, in the very early stages of this project, we noticed that, okay, open, openness is the key to trust. If we hide things that hurts or potentially hurts trust. And so what we did was that uh, in, in, uh, with the help of, of the uh, provider for the uh, operator services was to uh, be open sourced or they, they actually open sourced the gateway and also to make this more see through the actual mechanism was documented and uh, is currently part of, of the MIM4 of, of the uh, requirements for, for uh, person, personal information exchange. And I think this is very crucial that all the parts that can be open should be open. Uh, and in this, the data is not anonymized or pseudonymized in any way. And uh, as we all know, actually anonymizing data is, is very hard because when you start to combine that or you have like time series of things, you can make interesting 
interesting uh, facts out of, of a person with with very simple simple basic data data points. So so it's it's very hard to anonymize anything. So that it it really is is uh, valid and will will stand time and <laughs> resources. And also pseudonymizing or anonymizing things often makes them impersonal. So it's hard to actually benefit or check things. So in, in that we thought that it's actually easier to start with things that are personal and will stay personal, but we'll have a network of, of things that we can openly say that, okay, this is how this thing works and, and actually open, open all the logs and stuff to each person themselves, but not to everyone. So that uh, it's it's also you can't check things by the uh, consent records if if you are not actually eligible to that consent either by by as as a user or data source or as as a uh, data on the person that data is on 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 or, or about. So I think this is um, what what I had had on this use case, but also one important point in in trust and in in privacy in data is that. Uh, Sorry, Mika, are you yeah. moving your slide? Or, because we are seeing no. just to. Oh, okay, fine. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I only have one slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry for this. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I kind of like anticipated that there might be some some uh, challenges with the slides, which I don't seem to have. But <laughs> Fine enough. Thanks. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah. So I, I think that that one crucial point I, I will make, and then I'll, I'll give some time to questions or or the next presenters, is that uh, to actually make trust, we need several levels in, in the equation. One is the technology, of course. Then we need the legal, the, the uh, kind, of, kind of like legal points, how, how we are, are making the uh, agreements on stuff. And then we need some kind of societal, the ethical point. Why are we doing this? And, and, and the actual, actual like uh, background in there. And, and then, then the uh, kind of like business model, so that the ones who own the data, or or kind of like own the services that that are needing the data or providing the data, they can openly state that this is our model, this is how we work, and the community that uses it can kind of like check what's going on. And it, it has like the ethical rules of doing things are commonly available so that they can kind of like be checked. And of course, all the data access must be technically uh, sound and then again open to the extent that every user can check what's on, what's going on, and why. So I think the uh, my data. BLT sandwich is, is a good <laughs> good starting point in building trust within within this kind of environment. Yeah, thanks. This was thanks. mostly what I was trying to say. <laughs> Hopefully, I made some sense. Uh, more than uh, a lot of sense. Ma ma many thanks for this, and I will uh, now pass the floor to the other uh, to the other Mika. Uh, it was uh, um, interesting uh, the the previous speech because it introduced uh, another concept that is important uh, that is uh, the the role of data intermediary um, and so um, with this concept I will leave the floor to Mika. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Let's start by sharing the screen first. And uh, all right, so. Let me know if you see the screen. Perfect. All and right. We perfect. can also hear you well. Thank you. Happy to be here. 
My name is Mika Huhtamäki, I'm the CEO of Vastu Group. And uh, today I'm starting um, this speech from the privacy, security and trust from top down. So uh, first introducing the ingredients and uh, parts of uh, the security and privacy, what we have learned and then what we have learned in practical side when we have been working together with Helsinki and with a couple of uh, private sector customers as well. So first of all, trust is not just technology. It's a combination of business. And in a city context, we are speaking about use cases for residents that are beneficial. That's the kind of business angle. The legal, obviously, is the uh, way how we adapt these practices. And tech is the engine, the tool that we need to make it happen. And all that we have to reflect through the ethical point of view. So it's a business legal tech ethical angle to the trust. Then if we take the context for the trust, we are speaking about cities, but usually we are speaking about cities as a single unit, but city is a collection of different parties, some being private companies, some being city health companies. And then obviously cities have a lot of units which are controlled by certain laws based on the service that they have to provide. And uh, those limitations will also build barriers and actually silos for data. And uh, this is the context for the data and the privacy when we are speaking about cities. So it's a collection of companies, uh, units, and uh, other parties so that the data for the residents and the may happen. Then when we go to the legal side of that, GDPR is one angle to the distribution. And excuse me, please silence. Uh, the angle for sharing data. So we GDPR offers six different uh, processing criteria for data. Uh, and typically in a city context, we are speaking about uh, legitimate interest or public tasks, but now we want to extend the services and the better services for the citizens. So we are speaking actually about consent, which is the most flexible way to enhance uh, the services, what the residents can get from the city. So, so for the data sharing, GDPR offers a great ground and new tools for sharing the data in between the units. Then other angle is that city is not just counting on one single data source, but city needs data from the state, like in the previous example, city needs data from the private side in some cases, like private healthcare or, or private health companies. And then city has units uh, which, need, which needs to provide the data. And if every and single unit that has data provides their own separate permission service, then at the end, we are facing the reality where the residents have to access and manage their data through multiple, several different permission services. It's like a calling to a friend with a mobile, but you have to uh, call three times through different networks. So the question is that do cities need separate permission services or do cities actually need permissions as a service? And we believe in the second one because the usability and accessibility are vital parts of the privacy and security as well. It's not a good idea to have 10 different permission services for one single task. Now, uh, changing the current state, which is public task oriented, the consent is the tool in many of these cases. And the consent has to respect the person's will. So the person has to have the right to give, deny or revoke the consent. And there has to be a purpose. So if the data is being accessed by using a consent, then we need to respect the purpose. Only that purpose the consent is given for is valid for the data users. So it's most flexible, but also gives a framework for accessing the data. And this is good and great, excellent building for block for trust, because then we can show people that actually you can influence what of your data can be used and where. Then the last angle is the kind of infrastructure. So in many cases, when I'm speaking about my data and operators, 
uh, we are facing the discussion that, okay, are we generating yet another uh, vault of data? No, actually uh, my data operator, permission operator is something that is in, bit, in between the data using services, which are on the bottom gray and data providing services. And then on the top, the identity services, the services that will identify you like the bank IDs or different uh, local or countrywide identity services. My data operator acts in between of those and makes similar connections like teleoperator. Teleoperator doesn't store your phone calls, but it enables the connections in between the parties. And this is the kind of European way of thinking, which fits nicely into the upcoming Data Governance Act, where the data intermediary is enabling the connections in our eyes, but not acting as a additional data storage in typical case. And this is the separation of concerns approach. So this is the stack what we provide uh, for the city of Helsinki to make this happen. We map certain identity services, we manage the permissions, and then we provide this connectivity where the access gateway is open source part of it so that we can make it happen. Then one angle, what I want to emphasize is the identity and identifiers. And it's vital to understand that we have a lot of identifiers, and especially uh, in countries where the identifier is being used in several vital services provided by the cities or country, it's a, a sensitive number or, or uh, identifier that shouldn't be shared. And we want to encourage the development of services so that in the future, social security number or passport number is not anymore the identifier key in the actual services. So in this picture, what we do is that we, for example, take the bank ID and the Finnish social security number, and then we generate a specific service specific identifier, for example, for city of Helsinki in certain use cases, and instead of the social security number, they use the service specific identifier for the person. They know that it's well identified, but if someone breaks in, they cannot know that who is that person. Because typically in the data leaks, there is a leak of two items. One is the actual data, and the second one is the identifier, which it in many cases is the identity. And uh, by having this kind of architecture, we can separate the identifier from the data. And we have been using this in the real world evidence healthcare type of research, this, where the real world evidence research uh, company doesn't know the identifiers and the identities of the people. And we don't know the data, but at the end, national health organization can combine the data with the actual uh, data they have, and then they can uh, make the research data out of that. So separation actually uh, improves the privacy in certain cases. And this is just a detailed description of it. You can check it later on when you get the presentations. So building the trust, we need agreed roles and rules between the organizations and not all the organizations are public ones. It's a collaboration between the public, private and the state. And we need common agreements there. So we are speaking about rule book type of approach. Then the legal framework, has to support that. And the legal framework has to support the underlying technology. And we are speaking about certain minimalistic technology standards to enable the data flow, but still opening enough space for different providers to act there because not all data sharing is the same. We need different approaches. In some cases, this kind of data connection type of approach is too vital. In some cases, people can act as an own data storage by using their mobile phone, for example. So we need to be flexible enough with the technology approach so that we can have the minimum standardization that supports the legal and that is agreeable between the public, uh, private and governmental state parties. So, so these are the ingredients and lessons so far what we have learned and actually put in practice in a private sector and together with Helsinki now we have been establishing a city level trust and technology for data sharing in a network like 
this what I was describing. Uh, I think that we are running out of time and a little bit over time. Thank you for the opportunity to present this. And if you have any questions, please write those down and uh, I can answer later on if there's no time right now. Thank you. Thanks, really, really many thanks. Uh, as you said, though we are a little bit uh, uh, late, but uh, the, the, the session was extended. These are the good things to be the, the, the last session of the day. Uh, I, there is, uh, according to my knowledge, there, are, uh, there is no, no, no specific question for, for the session, but I would, if, um, if I may, I would put uh, a, a question to all of the, the speakers because uh, we learned today and we talked. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, the, the the trust that is built uh, along uh, uh, several uh, levels. So we talked about the technology that is one just one piece of, uh, um, let's say, uh, of the game. But we also include uh, the legal part, and uh, another element is the societal, societal part. So in particular, the level of people here. The question is. Uh, how uh, do you think it's uh, is important uh, the knowledge, the awareness of people involved, starting from cities to people involved in the uh, in uh, in city management uh, and also within uh, pub, uh, private operators. So the the importance of uh, reskilling and upskilling of people according to the new needs of uh, personal data management. You are just your personal opinion. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, I had some noise on the background. Well, no, they, they, I, I mean, uh, the, it's important in, in creating trust that we analyze the all yeah. the level, but the, can, can, the level of, you... sorry, Michael. Michael? Okay, I am repeating. So. The level, the, uh, um, let's say, we uh, yeah, talked. So, um, I, I spoke some time. Yeah, did you hear me? Can you hear me? Now, yes. There's obviously a long lag. Sorry. I, I think I will keep quiet because I don't um it will add anything. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying that we 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 said that the trust is made by different pieces. So we we, we talked about the technology, we talked about the legal aspect and societal uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the level of people, the level it's uh, is an important. So I'm I was just asking you uh, in your opinion, uh, um, oh, uh, the, the importance of creating the right awareness uh, uh, in people, so create the people awareness uh, in about uh, uh, personal data management, how is important, so the importance of skill, so reskilling and upskilling of people in all the personal data management uh, chain. So uh, what we have learned so far together with housing is that the best way is to have a couple of services which people can understand first. Of course, at the same time, we have been educating and testing the high school age people and uh, uh, communicating about this topic. But uh, at the end, it seems that once people get first impression of the services, we have been testing on a private sector truck drivers and sharing the driver's license. We have been also checking the uh, patients participating to the real world evidence cases where the re medical research and, and with the city of Helsinki, this subsidized daycare. And in all of these cases, it's difficult to explain up front, but once people get their hands on, then the light all of a sudden uh, comes up and they get the idea. So what I believe is that once we get a couple of cases up and running and people can test those, then they can start to think further and we have better ground 
to spread the message. But if we do not have anything, we, if we do not have any real things running there, it's a too abstract concept in many cases. So through these real life examples that people can test and try and see the results, that's in my opinion, the best way to get awareness and understanding for better personal data management. And after that experience, people are more aware and then they can actually start to give feedback and ideas for further development. So something concrete has to happen first and then it's better to get the feedback. That's, that's how I feel from different sector, sectors so far and what we have learned during the last two and a half years. Perfect, thanks. Mika. Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, yes, it's, it's crucial to educate the people uh, and, and truly, truly like, um, uh, well, to say the things in, in a simple and concrete manner uh, and, and actually be open about what's going to happen and why is this done this way and, and what's in it for you. Because also I think people have been kind of like scared about these, uh, you know, GAFAM doing evil things with your dates and, and uh, you losing losing your life because of of, of uh, some some uh, problems in, in, in data security and of course that's well and good people should be aware that there are risks uh, and it's essential that we educate the people that okay you should be actually careful of what you promise to who and why and then in our own things be very concrete, very simple and very straight spoken about, okay, this is what you are going to share, exactly this and nothing else. And that's why it's going to be shared. As, as uh, Mika said, it's important that we have concrete, full, normal life use cases, because through those people actually start to understand. Of course, we need the theory and we need this, kind of like uh, forerunners in, in privacy and, and uh, security to, to say, to like socially uh, say that, okay, it's, it's okay. This is well thought of, this is technically sound and, and it works. But we also need, need in every, each and every case, we need the concrete cases and we need in each case to actually tell the people what's going to happen and why. Educate the people on, on what in this case is going to happen, and then they start to see the pattern. And also it's very important that the pattern is consistent because now, for example, we are doing the same thing with uh, driver's licenses in, uh, with our, our, our staff. We are doing the same thing with uh, some, some other, other services, uh, parking and, and stuff like that. And in a way it starts like to snowball because, because we are doing the same simple things over and over again. That builds the awareness and that builds the uh, like acceptance of the things. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's essential to be open and to be see through in the things and, and you know, concretely give the people the data. Okay, this is what's, what's going to happen. Perfect, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So it's important to move piece by piece in an actual way, showing that things can be done and then replicate and scale. This is uh, the, uh, the, the key, the message. And by the way, is also how uh, living in uh, .eu is, uh, is pushing on. So thanks a lot to all the speakers today. We learn a lot about uh, the concept of trust and privacy in uh, managing personal uh, personal data, giving uh, people their the control over the data, but also allowing uh, companies and public entities to to manage uh, personal data and offering uh, more uh, customized and proactive service to citizens and uh, and their customer in general. Many thanks again uh, for the. Uh, to all the audience for following the, the session. I do hope everything was fine for you. Thanks a lot. I pass the floor to, to Martin that I see connected. Thanks a lot. Again. <laughs> Thanks, Roberto. Can thank I also you. thank you?
Thank you and thank you, Roberto. Um, we, we close the session here from our side and we reconvene tomorrow at nine um, where we have a, another full program and we start with the uh, guidelines and standards uh, for, for citizen communities. So a much more practice oriented view on this. Thank you so much and uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs>